Welcome back to Aurora Tech Channel. Today, I will review this Two Trees Bluer Plus larger scale 3D printer. It has a build volume of 300 by 300 by 400. It also has a pretty good hardware configuration, which I think is way above its price. Let's take a look at the configuration and see if you also think this is a good deal. The price for this printer on Amazon and AliExpress is around $350. I'm just going to point out the features that you normally can't find with a large-scale budget 3D printer in this price range and see how much they're worth. 1. 0.9 degree high precision stepper motors. There are only a few budget 3D printers that use 0.9 degree stepper motors. If I remember correctly, another printer that does use these stepper motors is the BQBX. The retail price of this printer is $550. Since ordinary stepper motors are 1.8 degrees and cost around $10, a 0.9 degree can theoretically provide a 100% higher resolution and it also costs double the price, which is $20. The printer uses 0.9 degree motors for X and Y, so the price would be $20. 2. A 300 by 300 PEI spring steel print surface. I have a few other printers that use similar PEI print surfaces, like the Prusa and the Ender 5 Pro. This kind of PEI print surface works extremely well with PLA. A print surface of this size is around $40. 3. A 3D touch bed leveling sensor. I have done a detailed test on this sensor in my previous videos, and I've put the video links in the description if you're interested. The accuracy was pretty close. It wasn't as good as a BL touch, but there was no noticeable difference in terms of print quality. This sensor is worth around $13. 4. The Dual Z Axis. The Dual Z system of this printer came with a timing belt and two wheels to synchronize the height of the gantry. Considering that a Dual Z Axis kit for a CR10 costs around $40, I would add $50 to this feature. 5. A 32 bit motherboard with TMC2209 silent stepper drivers. The 32-bit board is almost the same price as an 8-bit board, so I will just add $20 for the TMC2209 drivers. 6. A color 4.3-inch touchscreen. A classic LCD screen costs around $10, and a color touchscreen costs around $35, so I'll add another $25. 7. A set of belt tensioners. A set for the X and Y axis usually cost around $20 to $25, so I will add $20 to this upgrade. 8. A dual gear extruder. A standard single gear extruder costs a few dollars. A dual gear extruder like this BMG clone costs around $16 to $18, so I'll add $10. 9. An Ethernet cable to connect to the hot end and extruder. I consider this a pretty convenient upgrade, and I'll add $10. 10. A dual part cooling fan. A 24 volt fan generally costs a few dollars, so I will add $5 for this upgrade. These 10 features alone are worth $213. If you bought the cheapest large scale printer in the market for around $250 and added all these features, it would cost around $460. Since this printer is just around $350, I would consider it an awesome deal. Let's unbox it and see what's inside. The assembly of this printer is very simple. All you need to do is connect the gantry to the base with four screws, mount the hot end and mount the filament holder on top, and you're done. I will connect the gantry to the base first. Align the lead screws with the coupler and use the screws on the coupler to secure it. Please also make sure that the bottom screw is used to fix the stepper motor. Do the same to both sides. Next, 
I will mount the hot end to the x-axis, but I'm going to swap out the Bowden tube to a Capricorn tube, as I use it on almost every printer. This doesn't mean the stock one can't be used, but when you print at a higher temperature with ABS or ASA, you definitely want a Capricorn PTFE tube. The screws for the hot end are mounted on the x-axis, so just unscrew them and use them to secure the hot end. Then, I will flip it over and insert four long screws to secure the gantry. Since I already fixed the lead screws, when I flip it over, the gantry won't fall. Just turn it a few times with your finger. I will drag it to the side of the table and tighten them, as I don't want the pressure to be applied to one side when I tighten the screws. My bed is a little bit wobbly, so I will adjust the eccentric nuts on the side. Turn it in one direction to push the pulley wheel tighter until the bed is no longer wobbling. Then, remove the protective film on the bed and stick on the magnetic sticker. I would start with one corner and align it, and then apply pressure gently and smooth it out until it's as flat as possible. Put on the PEI spring steel sheet. Let's connect some cables. There are only three cables that connect from the base to the x-axis. This printer uses two ethernet cables to supply 24 volt power to the heat cartridge and the three 24 volt cooling fans inside the hot end assembly. This design is pretty good. Just follow the correct order to connect all of them and this should be easy. As you can see, the timing belt for the dual Z axis was loosened during transportation. In this case, I will remove the two lead screw mounts on the top so that the lead screws can move freely in order to put the belt back to its original position. Put the belt inside the wheel so the teeth can lock onto each other. Align both sides and then we can put the mounts back on. There are two 3D printed blocks on both sides of the gantry. They are just used to secure the frame when shipping. Remember to remove them before using the printer. I will insert my own Capricorn PTFE tube to the hot end and extruder, and make sure to push it all the way to the end. Finally, mount the filament holder and we can turn on the printer. This is the main menu. It has the same graphical UI as the Sapphire Plus, made by Maker Base. I will start with preheating the printer and doing auto bed leveling to make sure the limit switches, stepper motors, and the 3D touch are all working. Okay, the leveling is starting. It checks 9 points on the bed, and then a Z offset screen automatically shows up, which is pretty nice, so you don't have to go back and find the Z offset from the menu. Now, we need a paper to adjust the nozzle until it's close enough to scratch the paper on the print bed. I think the perfect distance is negative 2.8 millimeters. Let's click finish and do some test prints. I will start with a calibration cube. I use the Prusa Slicer and a CR Tennis Pro V2 profile, as these two printers are very similar. They have almost the same print volume, dual gear extruder, and a Bowden tube with a similar length, so the settings should work fine. It's now heating and ready to go. Since I put G29 to do auto bed leveling by default, it will level the bed before it prints. It probes 9 points again, and then it shows the Z offset screen. I've already set the perfect distance between the 3D touch and the nozzle, which is negative 2.8 millimeters. So I will just click finish and it should start the print. However, something weird happened next. It didn't show the information menu, which should show your current file name, the nozzle temperature, the bed temperature, and the remaining time of the print. It just returned to the main menu. I can navigate the menu, but there's no way I can bring up the information screen. It stayed on the main screen until the print finished. It's kind of weird, but if you print a cube like this, it's not a big deal, as it only takes around 25 to 30 minutes. But if you were printing a model that takes 20 hours to print, that would be a problem. The print actually looks very nice. You can compare it to the cube printed by the Prusa MK3S Plus. I really can't tell which one is better since they both look nice. 
considering that the Prusa is using the Prusa filament, which is more expensive and costs 25 euros, and the bluer is using the cheap PLA I bought from Amazon for $18, the print quality is really good. Next, I will try to print without the G29 auto leveling command in the G code using one of the sample G code files. It shows the info screen without any issues, so it seems that the firmware is not designed to accept the G29 starting G code. I tried another 3D Benchy without G29, and it also printed quite nicely. Let's compare it to the one printed by Prusa. Both of them have some very minor stringing, but besides that, the print quality of this bluer is pretty much at the same level as the Prusa. The overhanging and cooling are both really nice. I would also like to print something to compare with the Ender 5 Pro. As the Ender 5 Pro can print very high quality layers, I will compare the layer lines. As you can see, it also prints quite well. The flat surface is very clean, the layers are very even, and there's no sign of any bending issues. I would say that it's just as nice as the Ender 5 Pro. Finally, I will speed up the printer to 200% of the print speed, which is 80 millimeters per second. I tried to print a larger pen holder and some stackable boxes. The extrusion is as good as it was when printing at a normal speed. It can keep up with this slightly greater speed without any under extrusion. These five boxes took less than eight hours to print, with around one and a half hours each. It wasn't super fast, but the print quality and the speed are well balanced. This printer is using a volcano style heater block. The larger heat zone lets the filament melt faster, which allows you to print at a higher speed. I think it should work well with large diameter nozzles, like 0.8 millimeters or even one millimeters. I recently made a video using a CNC 3018 to make some aluminum parts and upgraded the Sapphire Plus Core XY printer to an E3D volcano hot end. It also worked pretty well. Okay, let's talk about what I think of this printer. First, the hardware configuration is really good. The manufacturing cost of the printer is higher than other printers in the same price range. The combination of the dual gear extruder, the dual cooling fans, and the volcano style heater block work really nicely in terms of print quality. It's comparable to the Prusa and Ender 5. There are some small detailed improvements, like the clean cable management, the heated bed cable strength relief, the metal sheet base, the aluminum parts, and the convenient access to the motherboard, which are also great. But like most other budget 3D printers, this printer is not perfect. The only issue I could really find is the firmware. The modified Marlin firmware with graphical interface from MakerBase didn't work with G29 in the starting G code. After auto bed leveling, it still prints normally, but you can't bring back the info screen during the entire print. I've printed all these models without using G29 to relevel the bed, as removing prints from this PEI spring steel sheet is easy. You don't need a spatula to remove the print with force, like on a glass bed or other build tech type print surfaces. So the print bed won't move at all. You may only need to re-level it once in a while, so it shouldn't be a big problem. Moreover, you can replace the stock MKS firmware with Marlin, just like what I did to my Sapphire Plus. Finally, I want to give two suggestions to two treats. First, I think they should consider putting Marlin firmware on their website. For a graphical interface, the MKS modified Marlin isn't that bad, but many users like me might prefer a highly customizable and stable classic Marlin firmware. Second, they could make it a direct drive, as a direct drive won't cost more than the Bowden tube setup. If I see the next version of the Bluer Plus having the same or more features with a direct drive and optional Marlin firmware still priced at around $350, I would consider that this is the best choice in the same class. I will probably make more videos to change it to a direct drive and flash a Marlin firmware. If you are interested in these upgrades, please leave a comment and let me know what you think. That's it for this video. If you like this video, please hit the like and subscribe button. My brother and I make a new video every weekend, so check out my channel on Mondays and you'll see something new. See you next week.